Hey, Terry here. Welcome to another video. About a year ago, my son had this crazy idea about putting together a short pitch video to present to Netflix in hopes of getting financing to start a Netflix television series. This would be a series of documentaries about ancient engineering. As a retired engineer, we kind of felt like we had the qualifications to do that. Uh, I have never done anything like that before in my life. You know, I'd never been in front of a camera before. Uh, I ended up, we had like zero budget, the two of us. So I ended up buying a tripod and a shotgun mic and using my iPhone. And uh, I wrote, produced, directed, and uh, presented a little short video about ancient engineering. Uh, sent it to my son, he did the pitch, and uh, of course we did not get the funding. So the video ended up on a thumb drive up on a shelf and I pretty much forgot about it. I decided I'm going to drag it back out and show it here for you today. Just for grins and giggles. Just for grins and giggles. So, enjoy. And if you like it, don't like it, whatever, feel free to leave a comment. And if you're a new viewer and you haven't subscribed yet, then I encourage you to click the like button. Got to fool that algorithm, the uh, subscribe button and the notification button so you don't miss out on any future fun. So, in its entirety, Ancient Engineering Part 1, The Fire Engine. Humans are, among other things, a species of builders. We love to build. And today, as our population continues to grow, building and construction permeates our lives like never before in history. From dams and skyscrapers to shopping plazas, hotels, and interstate highways. And almost everywhere we look, we see the people and machines that build them. But what a lot of us fail to appreciate is the underlying engineering that makes it all work. In fact, without engineering, there would be no human civilization at all. Even in cultures that today in the industrialized Western world we would call technologically primitive, one can still find the underlying principles of engineering at work. But you might be surprised to know that as impressive as modern engineering is, it all functions on just a very few simple principles that our ancestors discovered thousands of years ago and we've simply improved upon. But have humans always been engineers? Or could there have been a time in the distant past when there were humans but no engineering and one day somebody woke up and just decided to invent it all? And what exactly is engineering in the first place? Is it simply a profession that we go to school and learn to design and build structures and machines? Or could there be more to it than that? Well, the terms engineer and engineering come from the root word engine, which you might be surprised to know is itself a fairly recent invention. Today, we think of a machine as a complex mechanical device with a lot of moving parts powered by an engine. But it wasn't always like that. In fact, the idea of an engine as a power source to a machine is a very recent invention. In 25 BC, the Roman architect Marcus Vitruvius Pollio described an engine as any device that can be operated by only one person, whereas a machine is a device that requires two or more people to operate. And he wasn't simply referring to any object like this, but to a device with multiple moving parts designed to perform a specific function. So, prior to the invention of the steam engine in the early 19th century, engines and machines were very different indeed. A quick Google search over the internet this morning brought this up about engineering. 
the branch of science and technology concerned with the design, building, and use of engines, machines, or structures. And also, the work done by or the occupation of an engineer. Okay. And finally, my personal favorite, the action of working artfully to bring something about, which when I was growing up was called jury rigging. However, Webster's Standard Dictionary refers to engineering and an engineer like this. Engineering, the application of scientific knowledge to the solving of practical problems. And an engineer is one who plans and manages scientifically to contrive, to plan, and supervise. And notice it uses the word scientifically, not logically, and the term scientific knowledge, not scientific principles. See? Well, I guess you'll just have to take my word for it. But that is important, and uh, I'll bring that up later. Today, we don't have just engineers. We have a dizzying variety of types of engineers and engineering. We have so many types of engineering and, and engineering disciplines, in fact, that sometimes it seems like everyone is an engineer. And that's because, in a very real sense, we are all engineers. Engineering is in our DNA. It, could say it's one of the defining traits that make us human. All humans, even as children, invent things and, and engineer and re-engineer and shape the world around us to make our lives better and more convenient. Or it might seem like that at the time. Which brings me to this, the gasoline-powered lawnmower. Or more importantly, to these. These are what are known in the trade as interrupt safety devices because they interrupt something. Um, this particular mower is self-propelled and this bottom lever, when held in, engages the drivetrain and released disengages the drivetrain. So if I let go of the motor while it's running, it doesn't run down the street without me. This top one, which is the really important one, when held in, allows the flow of electricity from the generator to the spark plug keeping the motor going. And when I release it, it interrupts that flow and immediately stops the mower. But if I'm a particularly easily inconvenienced kind of fellow and I don't want to have to just hold both of these levers in while I'm mowing my yard, I can do something like this. Problem solved. And this is a very simple example of the third definition of engineering, working artfully to bring something about. And we all do things like this. We engineer and re-engineer, invent, reinvent, change, modify the world around us to suit ourselves and to resolve what we at least perceive to be practical problems. Maybe not the smartest thing I could do since it circumvents two very important safety devices intended for my personal safety. And uh, I never do things like this, by the way. Safety first. So engineering isn't just a profession taught in school. It is instead a way of using planning, innovation, and inventiveness in a scientific way to solve what we at least perceive to be practical problems, whether or not the solution is carefully thought out or just invented on the spot. And, as the engineers who designed and built the Titanic learned, doesn't always work out as we planned. And while you may think of a lawnmower as a machine being powered by an engine, Vitruvius would insist the entire device is in fact an engine. Okay, so now we have an idea of what engineering is, at least on its most basic level. But when and how did it all get started? Well, to answer that, we have to go back to the very first humans, about two and a half million years ago. In fact, to be really fair, 
we need to go back even further in time, about three and a half million years ago, to a species of ground-dwelling primate living in East Africa known as Africanus afarensis. Now, Afarensis was just a typical ground-dwelling primate at the time, stood about three feet tall, lived most likely on um, roots, grubs, berries, nuts, occasional dead animal when it could find one. But there were several things about it that set it apart from its other cousins at the time. One, it could stand upright. Africanus afarensis could stand and walk upright normally, which freed its hands for carrying things. Very important because what it meant was you could go out scavenging for food, load your arms up, take it back to the safety of your, your camp, like a tree or whatever you're camping in, and eat it there, which modern chimpanzees today can't do very well. Also, it allowed them to take care of injured, sick, old, who couldn't go out and forage. Others could bring food back to them. There's a very important difference. And then, also, Africanus had an opposable thumb, which means they can do this, which no other primate on Earth can do. And what that means is, where I can pick this thumb drive up like that if I want to, or like this, if I want to. A modern chimpanzee, for example, can't do that. It has to pick it up like this. And this gives us a much stronger grip for gripping a stick or a rock, which allows us to better use that stick or rock as a tool or as a weapon for self-defense. Afarensis also left behind the very first evidence of tool making among our oldest ancestors. They would, uh, basically what they look like is they just found rocks of the right size and would just bang them together. And if I had a couple pieces of flint, I could show you how they did that. But just bang a couple pieces of rock together until one broke or flaked off. And then they would use that flake or that broken piece as a tool with maybe minor refinement at, at best. Their tools were very crude by basically any subsequent standard. But don't think I'm minimizing the significance or the importance of their abilities. The tools made by Afarensis were far superior to any tool made by any other primate then or now. It's just that as far as tool making is concerned, they learned to break rocks up into pieces and then use those pieces as tools, probably to shape sticks with as well which you know, undoubtedly have not survived. And for Afarensis, that's as far as it went. They just didn't take it any further. If we fast forward about a million years to one of the last hominids to live, Homo erectus, things start to change. Homo erectus is commonly accepted as the very first true human for several reasons. One, they were the first hominid to take a rock that, say, just happened to fit their hand, and then sit down and deliberately shape it by whacking away at it very carefully in a planned manner so that it fit the shape of their hand better, and then refine the edge so that it would make a better cutting tool. And what they came up with was this, the hand axe, the very first human-made, all-purpose, generalized tool. This is an ax, a digging tool, it's a weapon, it's everything you need. It's inventive, it's clever, it's intelligent. It uh, clearly shows planning and a knowledge of stone. You don't just sit down and bang rocks together until this shows up. This takes some skill and some knowledge of stone to be able to make this. So did that make Homo erectus an engineer and was producing this stone, engineering that stone. No, I don't think it was, not yet. I think one very crucial element was missing. You see, it's one thing to demonstrate a certain scientific principle through some action. That could be purely coincidental. Just because I happen to guess the right answer to a math question, for example, doesn't demonstrate that I understand the underlying principles of mathematics or that I even know how to count. 
If someone asks me what is 4 plus 4 and I just happen to answer 8, okay, I gave the right answer. So as long as I give the same answer 8 to every question and that just happens to be the right answer, what is 6 plus 2? What is 10 minus 2? What is 2 times 4? What is 16 divided by 2? And I answer 8 every time, I'm giving the right answer, right? But am I demonstrating a knowledge of the principles of mathematics? No because as soon as I'm asked a question for which that same answer, 8, is not right, I lose. Homo erectus never seems to have taken that next step from using the thought process, the methodology that they use to produce this, to resolving any other problems. And in order to show an understanding of the underlying principles, of engineering, for example, it's necessary to see evidence of the same methodology, that same thought process being used to resolve other unrelated problems for which the same answer cannot apply. And Homo erectus just never did that. They just couldn't put it all together. We could say, in all fairness, the seed had been planted, it had maybe even germinated but it hadn't yet sprouted. And Homo erectus is known for another tremendous leap forward, and that is the conquest of fire. Um, we don't know exactly when, how, or who did it, but one day, possibly while exploring around amongst the, the dying ruins of a brush fire after a lightning storm, one Homo erectus happened upon a burning brand, a, a torch, an ember, and had the brilliant idea of capturing it, taking it back to their camp or the, to their cave maybe, and containing it and feeding it and keeping it alive and making it serve them. Other species of hominid before them may have used fire, but Homo erectus is the first species that we know used fire. We found their camps, we found their tools, we found the remains of their fire pits. But knowing how to capture fire from a natural source and take it back to your cave and then keep it alive isn't really inventing anything. It's a tremendous discovery, but it isn't actually inventing anything. And the problem is, if Homo erectus's fire died, they had to find a new source out in nature. They had to go on a quest for fire, as it were, and find a new source because if they didn't, they died with their fire. They never seem to have understood exactly what fire is or how to create it. So if their fire died, they died. And that was a very serious practical problem that Homo erectus never managed to solve. And it wasn't until around 200,000 years ago when the first Homo sapiens arrived on the scene that someone got around to resolving that problem with this, the hand friction fire drill. Now, in all fairness, there are at least a half a dozen different ways to start a fire using friction. And it's likely that they were all invented within the same general time frame uh, by different people in different locations. So it's hard to know which came first. But they all work on the same general principles. So the, the hand friction fire drill is as good an example as any other. And what is so important about the fire drill? Well, this isn't just reshaping an existing object, a stick or a rock, to serve a specific functional purpose, as impressive as that can be. This is something entirely new. Not just an object like a hand axe, but a system composed of two separate parts working together to exploit a very specific scientific principle to produce a very specific result. That's right, this is the world's very first engine, the fire engine. And this is when humans became engineers. Hand axes and spears are very handy tools and represent tremendous leaps in technology, but they aren't systems or engines, or structures for that matter. But the fire drill is deceptively simple. 
there's really more to it than it first seems. When I was in third grade, a classmate of mine once told me that his older brother, who was a Boy Scout, told him that Native Americans started fires by rubbing two sticks together. Fascinated by the prospect, as soon as I got home, I immediately rushed out into the backyard, picked up the first two sticks that I could find, and began furiously rubbing them together. Unfortunately, or because I was in third grade, maybe fortunately, nothing happened. And that's understandable in retrospective because the wind rubs tree branches together all the time, and yet trees don't suddenly just burst into flame every time a wind picks up. So what's going on? Assuming that my friend's older brother was right, and he was a Boy Scout after all, and our ancestors did start fires by rubbing sticks together, why doesn't this work? And more importantly, what needs to change to make it work? The answer to both of those questions lies in thermodynamics. There are three laws of thermodynamics that basically govern how the universe operates. Okay, for you science nerds and particle physicists out there, Yes, there are places in the universe where the three laws of thermodynamics can be bent or maybe don't even apply. But for us normal, non-Marvel superhero type humans stuck down here on Earth, the three laws of thermodynamics pretty much calls the shots. The first of those laws is energy cannot be created or destroyed, only changed in form which means you can't get something from nothing. Unless maybe you're Stephen Hawking. The second law is no energy conversion can be 100% efficient. Some energy is always lost as waste heat, which explains why there's no such thing as perpetual motion. And the third law is that energy always runs from a high state to a low state, which explains why batteries run down, which doesn't have anything to do with starting a fire. I just threw that one in for free, but it's the second law that we're interested in. You see, when I rub these sticks together, I'm imparting kinetic energy or the energy of motion into the wood. It's not just my hands that are moving. You can see the sticks are moving as well. The natural surface roughness of the sticks as they're rubbed against each other creates resistance, which generates friction. That friction excites the molecules in sticks, which then releases some of that energy back as heat. But the amount of heat released is extremely small compared to the amount of original kinetic energy that I have to put into the action. Plus, the surface area of these sticks, even though they look like they're small sticks, relatively speaking, the surface area is large enough that the small amount of heat generated is dissipated into the wood and then out into the air almost as quickly as it's generated. To get wood to instantly ignite into flame requires a temperature of around 700 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's a lot of heat to generate just by rubbing two sticks together. But we can get around that because we don't actually have to cause the sticks themselves to ignite into flame. Wood will carbonize or turn into charcoal at a much lower temperature at around 400 degrees. That charcoal, if it's a fine enough and if we can concentrate the heat down to a small enough surface area, can then create an ember. That ember can then be coaxed up to ignition temperature and start a fire. Which brings me back to this. If I have one piece of wood that is a hard wood and another piece of wood that is a soft wood, the hard wood will fit into this hole that I burn into it and on spinning it will slowly grind off a fine dust out of the softwood. That dust gets collected at the end of the taper, which just fits into the hole, 
and carbonizes and turns into an ember, which gets caught in this groove. And I can then coax that ember into up to ignition temperature and start a flame. It works something like this. have made fire. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. This is the first hard evidence that somebody was using the same scientific method, the same thought process or the same formula, if you will, to resolving unrelated problems because it didn't stop with the fire grill. In fact, about 70,000 years ago, somebody had an idea of attaching a string to a piece of flexible wood, which they could then use as a tension spring to throw small spears at animals when hunting. We call it the bow and arrow. But it didn't stop there because somebody, for whatever reason, saw a lot more potential in that new weapon they invented. By taking their bow and wrapping the, the string around the drill like this, Put it on there, right? Now, I'm going to put a cat piece on it, like so. Uh, I can hold it now. I can put a lot more pressure on the stick and really get this thing going. And that allows me to start a fire in less than half the time. Or in half the energy. And this is really the first hard evidence when we're seeing people are not just inventing new things, they're engineering new inventions. I mean, who on earth would have thought of combining a weapon with a fire generator to produce a better fire generator? Almost overnight, there was an explosion of new inventions and improvements at the mind-boggling rate of every few thousand years. In fact, so many new inventions and improvements to existing ones appear during this overlapping period between the Paleolithic and Neolithic era that sometimes it's hard to keep track of them all or even sort out which came first. The genie had been let out of the lamp for good or bad Humans had gone from a, being a species of tool makers to a species of engineers, and there was no going back.